So this presentation with a very enigmatic title of starting fresh every morning is about um, how we do continuous integration on Capital with Jeff Morgan. So I'll start off by introducing who I am. Uh, my name is Jan. I work for Jeff Morgan on Capital. I've uh, worked with them since February 2007. Prior to that, I was back in France working uh, mostly as a student um, in Brest, and I studied small in university. Got me hooked, and then I got a small job. Uh, what we're talking about, uh, we'll be talking about how we build images uh, in Capital. So, how do you do it in small talk? How do you do it in our own? Uh, in our own way at Jeff Morgan and what are the benefits for us and maybe the limitations of what we do. We, what we're not going to talk about, uh, we're not, well, this is not a financial lecture, because uh, I don't know anything about that stuff. Uh, we won't talk about a general way of doing continuous integration in small talk. Uh, this is not a flame war NV versus the rest of the world and things like that. So let me start off by introducing the Beast Capital as a big application. Uh, its current incarnation has been developed since 1995. Uh, it started off in New York, and now we've got development teams uh, in London, Glasgow, New York, and Hong Kong working on it. It's a big application, over 22,000 classes in it, without all our test cases. Uh, just to give an idea, the base BizWorks image with ND in it, it's got 2200 classes, more or less, it's just rounded numbers to make it look good. Um, we're more than 70 developers working on the application, uh, we push in changes every day. Uh, we've got a development cycle during which we'll change roughly 5,000 classes, the last one finished uh, a week and a half ago, we had changed more than 7,000 classes during that death cycle. The one before that was 5,500, 5,500, 5, sorry. And finally, each day we change between 60 and 150 classes in our application. Sorry? Uh, the production image is about 90 meg. The fan one is roughly 120. Um, so why do you want to change your image? Uh, let's look at various reasons. The first one is to re-synchronize the code base with other developers. You can resynchronizing the code base is something that's very easy to do if you're a small team or if you're a one-man team, because you can just sit next to each other, ask what the guys are doing, and then you can get it. But when you're 70 people working in three different time zones, pushing changes all the time, working on different parts of the application, it's kind of, kind of hard to keep track. So. Resynchronizing the code base helps us to keep it, keep track of what other people are doing and it helps us also to remerge our changes over the changes of other people. Because um, obviously if we're 70 pushing and changes every day, 150 classes change every day, it can happen that you'll change the same class as someone else and you need to remerge. The sooner you do it, the better. So every day, as I said previously, 60 to 150 classes. Um, in Capital, we work by change sets. We've got our own framework implemented over NV that handles change sets for us that we can export around and apply to maps. So we've got roughly 25 applied every day to the dev map, and I put them like 5 to 8 is the average size. So obviously, if you do the math, which are they for you? Much my calculator would be for me. Um, you see that it's quite likely that in a day we'll have a mismerge for two classes, two editions of one class going in over a week it's very likely, and over a development cycle, it's doomed to happen. Um, another advantage of resynchronizing the code base very often is that you're going to avoid multiple implementations. As you can imagine, in a big system like Capital, we've got various ways of doing the exact same thing, because I got in the office in Glasgow, I needed to do something, and I did it, but I didn't know that some guy got in the office the day before in New York and did it, but because he's only going, he's only going to apply it the day after that. So if you resync often, which we do every morning, that way you keep track of what's going in and you avoid having a hundred different, different ways of doing the same thing. Which is also quite good when you have to move forward or fix, fix a bug somewhere. Another reason why to change your image is to avoid important splits. Um, I worked uh, when I first joined on getting the, a new version of Seaside into Capital, and to do that, I had to split off the main branch 
to delete a bunch of passes and add new passes and while my work was still in progress I had to split off and then I was done in two weeks but then I, took, I spent another two weeks to actually remerge all my code against everything that I had moved in the main image. Um, had I known this I would have decomposed my work into smaller steps so I could do it every day and not have to spend at uh, the same time remerging that I did to do the changes. Um, so a good way of managing your changes is to decompose it into smaller steps and to put them in as time goes on. You can also use this to check your prerequisites. Uh, if, you, if you work with Smalltalk, you know that it's not especially easy to know what prerequisites your code has. You can, you can guess what the superclass is, you can probably guess what methods you're needing, but you're not necessarily certain where it's called, is it, is it in the right place, am I calling something that I should be calling? So the rule that we apply to chip warning is to always be the you have. Envy by, by nature is very grumpy. Mm -hmm. So I was complaining about stuff. You better use it. I'll say warning this, warning that, warning this, warning that. And so if you, if you make envy happy, which is very hard to do, you're probably, your prerequisites will probably be right. What can happen sometimes is that you'll be calling something that's actually higher up in your prereq tree. So when you get to that point in a code, you may not have the whole prereq tree loaded in, in the image you're working on then you can have stuff fall over and break, but I'll get into further detail when I look at how we can break the build. Uh, finally, another reason of changing your image is to avoid unknown dependencies. Now, I remember when I was a student, I made a project and I worked for three weeks on the same image, and then before sending it to my teacher, I said, oh, I just reeled the code in an image, and I load it in, and it doesn't load, and I didn't know what was wrong, so I went back to the other image, and that works, and then I figured that actually I needed the squeak compatible with the error bar, I had completely forgotten about it. Um, so avoiding dependencies uh, is a good thing. Now a way of avoiding unknown dependencies is to actually put stuff like this. If you were depending on my class or global variable in your code and you don't know if it's there or not, you can put that code. Obviously this is not good. Now you can argue that it can be good in some ways. But if you think of this as an initialized method, like if I boot my computer, <coughs> and when it's booting, it doesn't find a network card. And it just scales slightly to say, if the network card is there, then initialize it. If not, just keep on loading. And I get a fully loaded system, I've got no network, and I start using it. And you don't know what's wrong. I've got IT support to check through the logs. Don't find any, any sign that the network is not working. Because that's the kind of code that you have. So obviously, if you actually get an error in, in the load system, much easier to investigate than to remember that four years ago you put a check to slightly fail if, if you didn't have a network card. Okay, so now that we've seen um, how a general way of doing a small talk, let's look more, into more detail how Capital does it. But first of all, since we use Envy, and I'm not sure everyone's familiar with Envy, let me do a quick introduction of Envy. Um, if you know Envy better than I do, it can happen. Well, what happened, please don't me like me. Uh, so NV uses uh, two things called applications and configuration maps to hold your code. Um, if you use store, you'll have bundles and, and packages, I think. And, well, bundles and packages are probably more like app uh, applications and bundles somehow mimic configuration maps there. Uh, in an application, you can have other applications or classes or class extensions. And you can have prerequisites of other applications that you do uh, prereq. In configuration maps, a, a configuration map will include um, applications and it also has a list of all the other configuration maps or prereqs. So, the grand guarantee in ND is at the method level. So if you connect to your ND repository, you can go in your, in your browser, check a class, you can see all the versions of that class, of that method rather, sorry. You can see all the versions of that method, then you can see all the versions of a class, all the versions of an application, all the versions of a configuration map. Finally, Envy has a great flexibility, and you might want to hit up to fish yourself, because I do I like Envy, even with all its defaults. Um, so it allows us to have to 
fine tune our configurations that we raise for production to know exactly what changes we're putting through. Um, this is also done in coordination with all the change set framework we've built on top of NB. Um, but it allows us to, to know exactly what changes we're actually giving to the users when we set something to production. So let's get back to Capital and see how we do it. When we start building an image in Capital, we start by loading a top level map. This is an NVism to say that we start with the top, the top map on the top of our prereq tree, and we load this, and this will actually trigger a load of all the, pre all the prereqs, starting from the bottom and building all the application to the top. So we just reuse what's there in NV to start with, and we take benefit from that. Now, you might want to be careful there because ND can do some weird stuff sometimes. Uh, it has a tendency to fail slightly just to put a nice message on a transcript and just continue with whatever task you give it to do next. Uh, so you can get some weird stuff that happens when you try loading maps that are not loadable in your image. But that's basically how Capital does it. We start an image, we load the top level map, then we save it down, and that's, that's our build. Obviously, once you've made the build, if you read a few books about continuous integration, probably in the first three pages, you'll hear something about tests going on with it. Now, if you build an image, you've got an image, but you've validated that your code is still loadable, but you haven't validated anything more about your code, you still need to know, does my code still work? Does Capital still do what Capital is going to do? So you always want to, to validate it. In Capital, we distinguish two types of tests that we use to validate a build. Um, the first one is more of a code-driven test, something like SGX, we test specific code patterns. We know exactly what we're testing. If I send this message to this object, does it give me this value or that value? Um, so it's a very deterministic testing, knowing exactly what we're looking for and just making sure that this very specific thing still works. The other testing we do is data-driven, and in an application like Capital, which is mostly data-driven, this is something very important for us. So we do end-to-end -end testing, taking actual data, pushing it through Capital and see that it does not fall over, and that we do get the expected results on the other side. Um, so we do a distinction between two test systems for a data-driven test in Capital. We've got one that has a deep scope test. So the deep scope is that we test a very specific point functionality, but we test it over an extensive set of data. So we take, for example, all the financial products we have in a database, and we try to calculate the market value with the current image for every single product we have put in that day, and we see if that works or not. Um, another, another test we do is a wide scope test. So we take a selected part of data, we can't test everything because we don't have enough compute power. And then we, we send it through various functionalities that Capital does. So we send it to do risk management and this and generate this and generate that. And see that a wide scope of features is still, act, is still working but on a selected subset of trades in value. So once you validate your build, Capital goes slightly further. And we like to start a fresh image every time. So if you if you ever see a capital developer working, uh, you see that he always types an enigmatic command, doesn't have dot m in it, he just says what image he wants, and he'll just go grab the most recent copy of that image and start that one up. And <coughs> every time we start developing, we start a fresh image, which is the one that was built that day, and we reload our code changes into it. So we always ensure that our code changes can load. In a, in a fully built image. And this is something that's very important because that way you can easily ensure that you don't have, you haven't forgotten something that you were actually doing in that image to get this to work. So if I had that in uni, it would have saved me a few hours in that project. Yeah? Yep. Are you talking about for, for developers or for production or both? Uh, this is for development. So for production, because we work for a bank, and we have very strong auditing going on, we can't just tell them, load that new code change in your image and do this and do that. So we have to go through a whole release process. Um, but for, for development, we can just 
take a code change, load it into a fully built image. Um, of course, there are times when your image is going to be wrong. Um, I, again, when I was doing the port to Seaside, um, I had a point, a point I was deleting classes that were no longer needed, but I still had instances flying around in my image that I couldn't get to delete. So obviously I couldn't delete the class because I had instances in there. So on that day, the image was wrong, my code was right, and the build system was wrong. Finally, in Capital, there's one thing we don't like to do, which a lot of small talkers do like to do, is doing a save down. So a save down is basically taking your image as it is, go in, save image as, save it there, and you can restart the image in the exact state you left it. In Capital, we don't like to do this for various reasons. The first reason, I'm not sure remember what, but on the slides there. So building an image is great, but it takes time which is the big problem. It probably takes around 40 minutes to build an image, then we've got maybe a two hour window to do all the validation we need to make sure that it does still handle all the stuff we need it to. <coughs> so, what you can be tempted to do is just take the image with your code changes and save it down, and just use that image to do, your, to do your work on. Now, this is something that we do from time to time, but you can get several issues with it. The first problem is that, it's not a reproducible system. I don't know if I can recreate the very same image if I need to update it three months because you're off on holiday and you did that image and just sent an email saying here's the image, just start this one up and it'll work. I don't know what the changes are compared to the current development image, but we're to just the question with the development image it does have the changes that you added to it. Um, we didn't validate it. It didn't go through the whole validation process that we have part of the build, so we don't know if that image is still actually uh, offering all the functionality a capital image should offer. And finally, which is more of a, uh, an empty trick, if you start the image and connect to a repository that doesn't actually have all the code that you have in that image, then you see a lot of nice T1, T2s, T3s and so on in your image because you get a lot of decompiled code because it doesn't have all the, all the equivalent source and anyway. It could also lead to some weird wacky errors when you try to recache pointers and other things. Um, finally, let's get to the real real kicker here. Breaking the bill. Now this is my favorite part because I get sent an email to people telling the broke it. It will happen. It's it's doomed to happen. You will eventually break your build. If someone has continuous integration and never broke his build I would be tempted to say that he's not actually putting any changes into his application because eventually you're either going to break a test, break your process, break this, break that it's because you do changes and we don't have the time frame to test our changes completely before we have to push them through so we're eventually going to break it. That's why the testing system is there is to catch all that stuff. One thing in that case what you don't want to do is to let the build system become a burden. You don't want to be thinking Oh, I can't do this, I can't do that, because it's going to break the build, because I'm going to fail this test, because I'll cause this one to fail, or because this, or because that. You just, it's a test, we'll fix it, we'll work on it, we all work as a team in capital, and we just fix it and move on forward to the next problem. Again, it's nothing that it's time to check failing. If an estimate fails, you don't start yelling and crying because your estimate failed, you just fix it, or fix the code that broke the estimate and you just move on. This is the exact same thing, only with a full image. Okay, um, the first thing you want to do when the, break, when the build breaks, you want to identify the issue. Now, I don't know if you watch House. Well, I've been watching House lately, and what Dr. House does is that he sees a guy who's sick, and he says, treat him for that. And he has no clue whatsoever if that's what he's got, but Eventually, that guy can die, so he just treats the person. Um, you can be pretty sure that if you don't fix your build in the next half hour, your project isn't going to die. It'll, it'll still be there, and you'll just have lost half an hour because you tried to fix an error which actually wasn't the error you were looking for. So, make sure you identify the issue. First of all, to identify the issue, you need to identify the failure. Um, I've seen three types of failures. And on our build process in Capital, I would guess they probably port very well to any process you can do in a, in a small talk environment. 
Uh, first of all, you get a successful build by failing tests. So that's just a normal question. It's your code one. If you write something that you thought was going to work, but it actually doesn't work in other cases, it happens. You don't. You can't know when a system as big as Capital is your code going to work on every single feature that we have. The other question you can ask yourself is: Is your data wrong? Because maybe you're working on old data that's too old with the, the code you're trying to do, the change you're trying to do. Maybe you just need to refresh the data. You have for that test, and it'll work again. So that's the first type of failure. The second type is more final. It's an uncompleted build. Typically, that means that somewhere in your in loading the code, uh, this is not working. Yeah, can I just uh, check? When you talk about failing tests, so you're, are you meaning people's tests pass in their own image, so they submit and they get through smoke test, and then the build tests do not fa do not pass? No, it could be. Um, you have several types of failures. You've got either just they didn't actually test it, so they just put, push it in the image, and then that code fails. Um, they test it on a subset of data, thinking it works for me for what my, okay. my customer asked me to do and it doesn't work for another part of capital or maybe they just tested it too early they tested it on a Friday and then the Friday afternoon another test went in which actually broke on a Friday night okay, when, right, they, yeah. when they pushed it through on a Monday it wasn't a bad change anymore it had to be a Because it, it sounds to me like you're talking about the two cases of people actually being a bit slovenly on testing and people being quite proper but because you're getting this continuous integration, of course, they're, they're not quite up yeah, to date with the test. I, can't, I don't really want to throw the stone on all my fellow developers, especially when they're not there, it's a bit too easy. Yeah. Um, but the problem is that we get, we get changes and we've got, we're in a very fast moving business, yeah. so we have to be extremely responsive. So sometimes we just don't have the time to go through all, all the whole testing of waiting for an hour to see does this work or not. You just test it on the very specific te case, in a test case here. You're, you're fixing for production, and you just put in the dev version of it, yeah. and you see that it breaks up later on. But yeah. the important okay. thing is that okay. right. the business is still going. Um, so back to this, the uncompleted build. Um, this is this is quite fun, I find. Uh, typically, you're going to get a debugger pop up in your building session, and since this is small, but you just debug it, so you can go in and see what the problem is. So you always want to find the code change that introduced the error. Um, for us in Capital, we've got a bunch of uh, tools that we've built around this. Because we have change sets, we have a page where we publish all the change sets that go in between two builds. So we know exactly what change sets are included in that build. Then from then on, we can, we can go through the list, see what classes are touched, um, what things are changing in it, and is that acceptable of breaking the build? Does that match the error we're seeing in the build? But obviously, experience helps you to go faster through this list um, than you would if you're just if you're just near the process. But it's uh, it's good practice to to see what what your people are changing and how it can impact the build in ways you wouldn't suspect. Typically, what you're going to see that it's going to be a prerequisite um, error because of the way. Smalltalk loads code, it also compiles it on the fly to, to, to evaluate it in the image. So you can have cases where you've got an initialized method linking to a class and actually only loaded further down the line. So you, you try to call something and that class doesn't work, or a method that's only loaded later in an extension, it's not there yet, you get a message understood. So it's um, just using that kind of problem because of prerequisites. We're seeing in the first part that you don't really know what the prerequisites are and what the dependencies are for your code. This is a good check part. Uh, finally, the last type is probably more due to the way Envy handles uh, load failures. And I don't know if it would happen if you were using something like Store or Shell to do your build. Um, what happens is that the code doesn't load all the way. So you start loading your code, and for example, Envy doesn't have an override. So you're just going to get there and say have an override and then it just says, no, I don't do override, puts a warning, just stops loading the code and then the next part of the script does a save time and triggers all the tests, will 
we'll click it and it'll just save it down, push it through a test, and then you can see that obviously your tests are failing and they're failing because um, because the code isn't all there. So you try to do something, but the code to do it isn't there in the area. So that's a weird one that you have to go to the through end of validation to actually see that it all failed at the start. Um, typically for this, you, know, you want to know your source code management system well. As I said, Envy doesn't like overrides. There's a few other things that Envy doesn't like, but we've only got half an hour, so I won't go through the whole list. Um, but this is something that you want to be sure um, you know and know how to handle if you're going to do continuous integration. Finally, obviously, you have to fix your build at one point because otherwise you just uh, you just put the key the key down, pop it over, put the key in, draw the project. So as I said, uh, previously, uh, don't be Dr. House, find the issue first before you try to start shooting for it. Uh, only waste your time if you just start <coughs> fixing things because you might just be fixing a symptom, so you only be walking down instead of starting at the root of the problem and fixing it there. Um, of course, you want to fix the build before you can validate all the code changes that went in the previous day. Because the problem is that we have 75 to work on this, so when we rebuild an image in the morning, and we validate it. If our build somewhere from the build to the validation something fails, <coughs> we put yesterday's code changes and we put all today's code changes that aren't validated yet. So then, obviously, as we go on, we need to back, we need to bring it back online as soon as possible so that we can start validating all our changes again. So that's we got three types of errors you can get when to, to fix a build. You're, you're usually going to see something like this. Either you're calling a method that's not yet present, depending on the code that's not yet released, or you've got clashing code. Um, typically, number one and number two, they're going to show failures like an uncompleted build or a complete build that actually failed a load. Number three is going to either show a failing test, or it could be actually any clashing code that's just when you, you misheard the change of someone else. So let's look at the first one. Calling a method not yet present. Mm. I wrote a paper for this that has a more uh, uh, explained example. Let's so I'll try to make it quick. Um, typically, what you could have, if you have a, a class size initialized method on, on your class that uses a six way width on order collection, and you can do order collection with one, two, three, with one, with two, with three, with four, with five, with six. To initialize one of your class variables. When you load that in a fully when you have that in a fully loaded image, you run it and it works fine. But it so happens that maybe that met that initialized method is actually lower down in the build that where that six way width is introduced. So you could get in a case where you actually initialize a class and load and that method isn't there, you get a message and understood. And that's typically what, what you get. Um, you can also depend on code that's not yet released. Um, um, so this is going to happen when you work at a team, you're usually going to know what your teammates are doing and what you're working on. So you might have a change that's slightly linked to what they're doing. So you might be loading their change in when you work on yours, but you finish first and you just push yours forgetting they haven't pushed there is. And then you're actually waiting for a method. You're calling a method that your teammate introduced, but he hasn't applied his change, but it's not there yet. So that's the second type of failure. Uh, finally, clashing code. Uh, clashing code is also called mismatch code. Now, I don't know if this is a very is a capitalism because we have a lot of weird words that we use to talk about all the way we handle code changes. Um, if you're if you're working on the same class and I introduce one method and you introduce another one, but we we all build from the same ancestry. I apply my change first and you apply yours. So my method has to disappear because yours yours doesn't include it. My code expects that method to be there, so that all over. That's using clashing code. Uh, so typically, you just need to remerge one of the classes on top of it. In a system big like Capital, you're going to see that some of the classes are sensitive to very high activity. We've got classes that probably get changed every week, if not every day. Um, and you can just see over the several weeks that this class has been changed five times in five days. That's because of the way Baby Capital isn't the ideal software development system. We don't have the whole separation of the code, it's a bit organic, it just 
grew up that way. Um, I think, I think this is it. So if you have any questions. Part of the problem you're mentioning is because, of course, correct me if I'm wrong, Capital is loading, following Envy, class versions. It's not loading class definitions and method definitions separately. Has anyone thought of trying to introduce an equivalent of the reduced conflict class uh, and kind of make, make Envy actually load class definitions and, or, or make the Capital system load class definitions and method definitions to try and avoid those conflicts? Um, I think the easiest approach we have is to actually make Envy happy. It's easiest for us because, firstly, we're the only ones actually using Envy in Fluidware 7, so we, yeah. we bought the source code back, so we just maintain our own version of it. Uh, we could do heavy changes like that, but it wouldn't be easy to do. It wouldn't be easy to justify spending time on doing it either. This is an easier way of making sure that we still have something that Envy is remotely happy with. Talk to you about it offline. So, if the build is broken and uh, not fixed in time, will there be no new images the next day? Yeah, we'll keep on using the old image until until we fix a new one. Since the fewest days image we know um, did pass all the validation tests. Now, the problem you can get is for, you can mismerge code because you won't, you're not working on the latest version of it, but it's close enough. Did I get it right? Uh, how much does uh, the cycle for the normal developer look like? Does he really uh, get somewhere laid out the precious image? He, uh, he opens it and then reloads all the precious stuff from any that he had opened? Or do you force anybody to uh, version everything at the end of the day? No, we don't force the version of their changes at the end of the day. Um, we have um, a weekly rollover of Envy because the dominant version of Envy where all of them are image connected. So we can keep open editions for a whole week. And then, mm. and then we usually try to version it off once it's, it's good. But every that is free to do. Mm. As you wish it or not. Mm. And as you said, the, the developers do not um, save the images or? No, they don't, they don't save the images. They save the code changes. We've got a whole framework built in that so we can take an image and capture all the changes we did compared to the map that was built on top of. Then we find all the class additions we've actually modified. We can keep this so we start a fresh image and reload those code changes into it. Change and see what you did. And you can filter through a change to see which one you want to keep, which ones you don't need anymore. 